Well, folks, let's take a break and uh, finally had a chance to catch up with my my uh, best and new friend here. Brian O'Hare is joining us live via Zoom. I want to catch up with some things going on uh, recently in his neck of the woods and also tell you about how he's going to be joining us here in our neck of the woods. Brian, how are you today? <laughs> I'm amazing. It's a rainy, horrible, gray, cold day in Los Angeles. It, a day that defies the stereotypes of, you know, the palm trees and the beaches and the glamour. It's, I'm freezing. That's awesome. <laughs> but I might as well come to Buffalo, I'll... right? Yeah, yeah. All, all the poets are going to be joining you now if it's if it's dark and gloomy. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's great. Well, I, I know our listeners have been following you online. We've been uh, doing some fun little things there for you. Can you tell us a little bit about the film festival and how everything played out? And um, and please remind our listeners how they can support your work, too. Absolutely. Um, so um, we had our film, Rizu, which um, a short film about an eight-year-old girl deciding whether to wear the scarf or the hijab for a class picture in Tehran, which we shot in Los Angeles, um, by the way. It was just picked up by The New Yorker as well for for streaming on their in their screening room as they call it but it premiered in london in october at the uh, british film institute london film festival and it was terrific i mean it, you know it's it's one of those things you make a film and what it makes you laugh uh you know you think it's good uh and there's little things that you love about it or about the performances but who knows whether it translates to, you know, the big wide world. You know, it's almost like having a kid in a way. It's like you love the kid and you see all the the sort of like wonderful traits about the kid, the empathy or the, you know, the compassion. I don't know, whatever. Right. But then, you know, you send your kid off to school and, you know, somebody shoves your kid down because like they're wearing the wrong sneakers or something. Um, and it's kind of like that with a film. And I have to say that, you know, we had a sold out screening and people laughed, which was great because, again, given the subject matter and, you know, given the part of the world that the story is originating from, I think we're so used to a certain kind of like, I don't know, just like a, a dark cloud, like everything is bad all, you know, all the time. Because I think that's all we get from, you know, the Middle East uh, in these areas. But, you know, it's filled with a lot of people who you know, love their kids, kids who just want to play or whatever it is. And, you know, here's a story about a kid, you know, who in again in the film, who's originally from California and she's trying to make sense of this strange culture. Um, but it's a really funny film. And there's a lot of like, you know, love and empathy in it. And people laughed and they got all that. And they weren't, you know, ex you know, weren't wondering like why the you know the kid didn't get beat by the the mullah or the mom or whatever it was so it was a good human story and that's what attracted me to it and that's why me and my producing partner azade and we have seemingly these very different backgrounds you know the the once upon a time marine from pittsburgh and the once upon a time muslim from tehran uh, but we have a lot in common because it's a human we connect on like this human aspect. I've got kids, you know what I mean? And so a kid in Tehran, I understand that from the perspective of a father, you know, lots of us have kids, all of us love people. So anyway, it was a, it was a terrific screening. Great story and uh great work by you and your, your team there. It was well done. And there's no surprise that it got into the festival. I mean, that's, that's the point, right? Cream well, right to the top, so. You'd be surprised, though, too. I mean, I think this is an important thing for everybody to understand. I mean, regardless of what you do, there's so much rejection that's associated with things. That film got rejected by a ton of film festivals before mm -hmm. that. As all the stories in my book, Surrender, I mean, I, I looked at, there was like a listing. I think it got rejected like 300 times. And... You know, I think, you know, it speaks to, again, regardless of what we're doing is this kind of like persistence that yeah. we have to do and to become friends with, you know, rejection or the word no, um, because it's just, a, you know, and to kind of like, go, like, 
sort of like, you know, water off a duck's back type thing, just to continue to get up and move on. Uh, Cause all it takes is one. Yes. And I mean, we actually had turned down a really good festival, uh, you know, leading up to the British Film Institute, which is was a higher sort of tier or more prestigious festival, um, which was really hard to do because you get a bunch of rejections. You get this, you know, acceptance from a very good, a very good, very respectable festival or very respected festival and go, mm, I'm sorry, but we're going to roll the dice. And it paid off. So, I mean, again, I think it's just Love for it. me, you know, this is not just about filmmaking. This is like a life lesson. Right. Um, and you know it's 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 not all just you know wow we're in london this is amazing everybody thinks it's great a lot of dark clouds leading yeah. up to yeah. in, in you know recriminations and like ooh, did we make the right decision so anyway i just passed yeah. that along yeah well it's, it's just like in both of our worlds uh overnight success is easy it only takes 20 years of grinding exactly <laughs> absolutely and again too like you and i both have kids and i think <laughs> It's and it was one of those things that like especially with the uh, the my writing I shared with my kids every time that I got a rejection because they were they were abundant and you know just to kind of show them like whatever we can still sit here and have dinner and laugh or or whatever yes it stings but we got to move on yeah. and it's okay to fail because I think especially two kids when they look at their parents. They think like, oh wow, this person's so amazing. They know how to drive. They don't have a bedtime. You know, they can they can eat a bag of potato chips if they want to. <laughs> you know, all that stuff. Um, I think it's important to show them as well that we're still, you know, struggling might not be the right word, but we're still persevering forward in kind of making the best decisions that we can, and that it is okay to fail. Um, because it was really nice then to share with them that first, you know, acceptance. It's like, oh, here we go. You know, it took 175 times and this story got accepted. And then to share with them that, hey, all these stories got published in this book. Um, you know, and, and too, the importance of like taking taking the shot at the target. Yeah. You, you have to do it. I know all, I, I this town, oh man, L.A. is just, it's a town littered with talented people. Because, you know, the most talented people, whether it's from, you know, Erie County or Allegheny County in Pittsburgh or London or wherever it is, they all come here. Mm -hmm. And along the way, there's all these things, these obstacles that get thrown at us to knock you off the path. For some people, it's alcohol. Some people, it's drugs. Some people, it's depression, you know, mental, you know, illness, depression, whatever. Um you know, but you just have to keep moving forward. And, and people I know, like, never take a chance. I'm like, what did you come here for mm -hmm. if not to take a chance? And again, it could be for anything. You, you got to take your shot at the target. You're going to miss most of the time, but sometimes you hit the 10 ring. So anyway. Yeah, yeah I love it. It's just like I, I think about some of the greats, you know, like, like Ty Cobb, uh, veteran, by the way, but known for his baseball career. And known for the having this the, the the best record, even though he missed you know uh, six out of you know, yeah, exactly six out of ten swings or whatever you know, but still no one's come close to that simply because yeah. he had more time and he kept going up there. He had more attempts, more attempts, more attempts. Well, you mean Ted Williams, not Ty Cobb? Oh, I, was, I was saying Ty Cobb. So yeah, sorry. Ted, not Ted. Yeah, Ted Williams, a 400 hitter, Marine pilot yeah. who left in the middle of his right after hitting 400 to go fly Corsairs or whatever in Korea. Mm. Wow. Yeah, exactly. He failed 60. He had a 40 percent success rate. That's an F. Yeah. You know what I mean? Here, here's he, not, yeah, another another story of F. And, and to your point of what you did with with which was brilliant to share your um, what someone may have thought was a failure with your kids that's brilliant because you think of people like the, the founder of fedex you know in his office a veteran by the way in his office is a framed uh paper he did in college that he that he failed he didn't get a good grade because he had put on a business plan of what ultimately became fedex wow so he was told you're a fool for doing this you can't even get a good grade in school for this much less 
and, and and the write up on it by the the teacher was remarkable because it highlighted all the things that were wrong with the idea, and yet he implemented them in re, real in the real world, and it worked just fine. So, and, and I think that <laughs> you know it's interesting too because I think as we grow up, and it's something that I had to I have had to wrestle with since leaving the service was sometimes we have a tendency to put too much like give too much credence to petty authorities in a way. And I mean, certainly a teacher, I mean, I, I'm not, trust me, I've had amazing teachers, amazing right. professors. Yeah. Same here. But a teacher who gives you an F or a professor who gives you an F for your FedEx, your, what becomes FedEx, that doesn't mean that they know, you know, the, this person, yes, is a, is a petty authority and that they, they, you shouldn't, collapse because they gave you an app because maybe you know that the professor is human too right. uh, but again I, I think sometimes from our background or again at least i'm speaking for myself that sometimes i will sort of get like "Ooh, that person's like the head librarian at this la branch library and i'm trying to get them to stock my book or whatever but i'm like wait a minute like who cares but again, that from that background, we, you know, we're so used to like a hierarchy, like that person is a battalion commander. Um, <laughs> what's a battalion commander, though? I don't know. He's just kind of a upper mid level manager and he's just making it up, too. So, yeah, <laughs> lots of petty authorities in the world that we have to sort of have a healthy disrespect for, I think. Yeah. <laughs> you can note it, but you don't have to you don't have to abide. No, exactly. Instructions, yeah. Absolutely. Well, you, you've certainly staying busy. You have a lot of projects going on, obviously. Um, I like following you, and you're on Instagram. You're on all these social media outlets. And, folks, you can find find uh, Brian through our site, obviously, and connect with him, follow him, and all that. But uh, let's let's talk about this thing coming up. You're going to be coming up to visit us in, uh, in Buffalo here. Can't wait. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And as I'm so fond of saying, it's okay. So everybody, uh, we're going to be at the University of Buffalo Thursday, May 2nd at 5 p.m. Buffalo wing time. There you go. Buffalo wing it's, time. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And that's opposed. So five o'clock Buffalo wing time is two o'clock Los Angeles taco time. <laughs> but everybody, we're talking Buffalo wing time, not L.A. taco time. But we are going to have a great event we've got some cool people um who are going to be talking about storytelling you know whether it's filmmaking whether it's writing whether it's music i mean i kind of see all this stuff as storytelling uh you know even you know as i've brought up too like an email is a story a text is a story so it's not just something that other people do like we are all in some form storytellers um, and you know, the better a storyteller that you are in your life, the, you know, the more riches, shall we say, that can come your way, because we all want something, even if it's just a smile from the, you know, person who's making your coffee in the morning. Um, so yeah, University of Buffalo, Thursday, May 2nd, five o'clock. Um, it's going to be great. I'm yeah. going to show it. I'm, I'm sorry, I cut you off, Rob. We're going to screen the film that we've been talking about here too, Rizu. It's a 15-minute film. And trust me, you're going to want to see this film. It's fantastic. So please come out. And I promise you, I guarantee you a good time. Yeah, absolutely. And folks, I'll be there as well. And, and there's a link to uh, register if you want to, you know, it's, it's a it's a free event. It's open to the public. But we do need to, you know, count heads, make sure you have a good, good, comfortable seat and uh, get a chance to see and actually talk to Brian. There'll be a Q&A uh, at some point in the evening as well. And it's in it's uh, part of the UB English department. So there'll be some students there. There'll be some alumni, some of the folks from the media. And it's going to be a good time uh, for all. And you know, frankly, I'm I'm in it just to uh, you know hang out with uh, Brian, <laughs> see Brian, <laughs> and uh, his other friends and other folks that'll be on the panel. And it's going to be just a, just going to be a great great social event as well. Absolutely, and, and as you can probably tell, everybody out there in Erie and Niagara counties, that I'm not afraid of talking. I like to talk. Um, so don't be shy. Come on up. I'll be it'd be very obvious who I am. Um, 
So can't wait to meet you all. I'll talk about anything. I'll talk about kielbasa. I'll talk about, you know, Genesee cream ale. I don't care. I'm so excited to be coming to Western New York. Again, I'm a Pittsburgher. And I think, you know, there, you know, by, you know, that's where I grew up. So I, I love that part of the world. And it's always a treat to be able to dip back into these very familiar and, you know, comfortable waters oh, so i'm sure. can't wait to come to buffalo for sure buffalo and and uh pittsburgh go hand in hand i mean the the, the steelers you know this was a big steel town as well you had the lumber yards back in the 70s and 80s you could be in either city it was the same city uh, absolutely with respect i mean that to, to both cities of course but uh and and i hope you bring some uh if you bring some or we'll have some or we'll figure it out but we'll make sure there's some copies of your book maybe we can get some autographs for some folks and uh, they can buy a copy of her book while you're here. and, and um... Absolutely. I, I mean, as I always tell people, the book is 20 bucks. I will turn that book into a work of art because I like to, when I sign it, I don't just sign my name. And you're gonna, <laughs> there you go. In, in 50 years, your kids are going to be able to sell that book on eBay for a lot of money. So there it's an go. investment. <laughs> um, but right now it's 20 bucks and it's like, it's cheaper. Well, it's cheaper than three LA beers, um, probably like 10 <laughs> beers, but you know, guess what? No hangover either. I mean, that's where, where else? I mean, 20 bucks <laughs> is like nothing anymore. It's, it's basically free. Yep. And like you'll be able to sell it as a big investment in <laughs> half, a, half a century. Anyway. Very so good. yes, I'll have books. I think eBay in 50 years will probably just be like a, a, a button we press on our brains to get to the internet. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm happy with that. Of the glasses, I'm not sure how it's going to be. In the exactly. Yeah, so, well, that'd be great, Brian. I'm, I'm I'm very excited to finally uh, see you in person. Yeah. You know, calls and zooms are great, but there's there's nothing that there's nothing that compares to a good firm handshake and, and laughter together. So, uh, folks, make sure you you join us. Uh, oh, good. No, I was just going to say, I, I know you're you're wrapping up here, but I actually just did something that I think that your listeners and the veterans would be interested in. Um, in January, uh, I went back. So I'm a, a Marine Corps veteran of the Persian Gulf War. And on was it January 19th, I flew to Saudi Arabia and I drove from I flew into Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, which is on the Red Sea. Uh, in the sort of like southwest of the country. And I drove across Saudi Arabia to Kafji, which is on the Persian Gulf, just at the border with Kuwait. Wow. And, and then went to Kuwait City. Wow, is all I have to say. Um, you know, I ran into camel herders who milked camels for me and I drank hot camel milk from metal bowls, like in the middle of the desert. I had people literally pull me off the street to come have feasts in their house. Wow. Um, that happened in Kafji, uh, where, of course, the Iraqis and Iraqi armor uh, unit, or I don't know how big it was, maybe it was a division, had rolled into in, what was it, January 29th in 91. Um, again, where the war was very real to people in Kafji because, you know, as they took us around the town, they're like, this is the bridge that Saddam blew up. Saddam blew up this. He did that. So they took us to their house and we had, I mean, it was a feast, like where they had called all their friends over and there were these huge, like, calling them chafing dishes doesn't do them justice because they were like huge bowls with like, you know, fresh seafood from the Persian Gulf and, you know, sausage and stuffed peppers wow. and mountains of rice. Amazing. And again, these are people that basically the, the approach was we we're taking a picture of the gate to go into Kafji because we remembered it. It was the, like the one thing that we recognized from 1991 where a guy had pulled up in his car and he's like, you, sir, he goes, get in my car. Come to my house now. We drink coffee. We drink tea. We smoke shisha because we eat food. And for me, that's like the best approach you can do. I was sold immediately and jumped into his car. And my two friends who I was traveling with, one of them was uh, also a Marine veteran of the Gulf War. 
they were kind of hemming and hawing a bit. And I just looked over through the open driver's side window. I was like, we're doing this. Uh, <laughs> we can talk about it later. But this is something that we're absolutely doing. And so you might as well get in. That's so they got in. And we spent like six hours with these people. It was incredible. Same wow. thing happened. Like we had to actually turn down invitations to eat in Kuwait City because we were stuffed already. And, you know, instead, these people took us out to drink tea, to drink coffee. Um, and in Kuwait City, I have to say, their relationship to the Persian Gulf War, absolutely different because, well, that that country and that city was occupied for six months and they endured, you know, people were executed. Um, there was even, uh, it was, again, like, that war is kind of like an asterisk in a way in American culture, because it's sort of like people that confuse it with Iraq and Afghanistan all the time, because they've completely forgotten about that. You know, in 1991, this thing happened, whatever. That's fine. I get it. It was a very short war, but to hear people like kids, essentially, we were getting coffee at our hotel in Kuwait city and the woman, you know, the young woman, she must have been 21, 22, a college student born, you know, 10, 12 years after the war, asking the questions like, so, so what are you guys doing here? Why are you here? And we had explained it. And she just stopped with the coffees in her hand. She goes, oh, she goes, you are the reason why we are free and why we have freedom. And Generally, you know, I'm a bit of a cynic when people use those words and stuff. I get, you know, it's, they're almost sort of like not meaningless, but I get a little like, oh, okay, whatever. We just throw those terms freedom around a lot, but we don't really know what that means. But to this kid, this young woman, like it was something that was very real. It was very living and breathing to her. Clearly, her parents that were there during the early 90, you know, during 91. Right. And they had taught her that, hey, we are free because of, you know, the United States, because the US Marine Corps and Army and Air Force. Um, so it was kind of, it was really, it was sort of, it was humbling. Because again, cynical guy that I am at age 57, to have somebody sort of call me on that in a very nice way, it was very disarming. Yeah, and it's a beautiful felt, moment. Yeah, you know, it was a truly because again, it's sort of, I think I know it all at age fifty-seven. I think I've seen it all. I think I've seen every angle, in, you know, again, this twenty-one-year-old essentially like showed me something that I hadn't seen before or thought about, and that sentiment was repeated many times during the we were in kuwait city four days um because that's very real for them it's sort of like the best way i can describe it is the experience of like 9 11. i watched it on my tv here in los angeles and while unbelievably horrifying it didn't happen in downtown los angeles so and now that it's been what 23 years and so there's part of me you know, while I haven't lost the horror of it or the significance of it, I didn't witness it with my own eyes. And it wasn't my neighbors. It was my, you know, my fellow Americans. But, you know, you talk to New Yorkers and people are like, no, actually, I was there. I watched it, you right. know, right. burn. My neighbor was on the 103rd floor or whatever it was. My cousin, you know, was a firefighter or whatever and died in the rubble or has died since from, you know, Carcin carcinogenic you know exposure or whatever so it's so real to new yorkers in a way that it's not to other people and i think that like that experience in in kuwait and kuwait city was like that like as soon as we had gotten off the airplane they had essentially what they called like the wall the 1991 wall of martyrs and they had pictures of all the the kuwaitis who had been executed or died fighting the iraqis and it sort of stopped me in my tracks. And I said something about it in like a security guy, like I guess like a Kuwaiti TSA guy goes, yeah, he goes, they killed my uncle. My uncle was in you know, a major in the Kuwaiti army. And he's like, they executed him. So like immediately there was this very real connection where everybody had somebody or knew somebody or was connected to somebody who was you know directly impacted by that, uh, you know, the occupation 
and you know the horrors of the occupation. So anyway, it was it was an amazing trip, and I, I don't you know there's not a lot to see war wise. I mean, if any, I I don't anticipate lots of Persian Gulf War vets like rushing to go drive across Saudi Arabia, right. but I will say though that the hospitality was humbling, um, and it, in a way. You know, it kind of like it made like Saudi culture and Saudi people and Kuwaiti people kind of real to me in a way that it wasn't real in 1991 because we were so like separate. We were there to do a job. And as soon as the job was over there, you know, it was like, OK, now get out of here. And we were happy to get out of there. So we didn't really have any connection with like, you know people in their homes or whatever and so that trip really kind of like humanized it for me and it was really it was very moving it was really cool i can only imagine i can only imagine <clears throat> i talked to some vietnam vets that have gone back to vietnam and uh, to some degree similar things that surprised them yeah. about people and how they were you know how they were welcomed and, and yeah it's uh, you know, I think about my time in Iraq. It's it's been twenty years. I wonder what they'll be like. You know, <laughs> another twenty years from now, it'll be interesting. But uh, I'm glad you had that experience. I mean, as a, as a just purely for yourself. I know you were there with a group, but that must have been um, rewarding on many levels and enlightening on others. And you know, that's that right there is a story, right? That's that that right there is a whole other book. <laughs> Absolutely, and I mean, again, the is you know, I was talking about the film, like. Again, so why does the once upon a time Marine from Pittsburgh and the once upon a time Muslim from Tehran have anything in common? Well, that's the thing, you know what I mean? Because again, going into somebody's home and they want, they want, they love that you're there. They're proud of where they're from and they want to sh kind of show off what makes their culture or their family or whatever it is or their mom's cooking or whatever it is terrific they want to share it with you because you're another human being and they want to introduce you to like oh this is my son or whatever you know what i mean and mm -hmm. like in again i have a son um and we love our sons and you know we watched you know soccer on tv and we can all like relate to that and i think it's again Connecting as human beings is so important. I think it's like so important for like the future of the world. Um, you know, I I just hope that we're able to come to sort of like a, a kind of an appreciation for that, you know, while retaining what's great about, you know, again, uh, kielbasa from Buffalo, um, you know, uh, fish prepared a certain way from the Persian Gulf or Red Sea mm -hmm. and drinking tea i'm not that, that trip turned me into a tea drinker too i can't believe it <laughs> i'm a committed coffee drinker i came away from that i love like that like arab style tea i'm yeah. a tea drinker tea wow. can be stronger than coffee yeah that's for no, sure. exactly yeah. um so anyway i'm just saying that like again i think it's important that we all like really let the the sort of surface stuff about like oh, i don't know that guy's wearing something funny on his head and he doesn't you know, I don't even know what he's saying. He doesn't speak English because I think, again, we all have a lot more in common than we don't. And, and we've talked about this. That's what I loved about being in the Marine Corps, in the military, is that we we're able to sort of like, not just sort of learn to live with each other, but sort of appreciate too, of like, oh, wow. Okay. This, this person grew up in a completely different way for me, or his parents might have walked here or whatever it is, but we all sort of like, again, it's like an alternate ethnicity. Again, the U.S. military. Yeah, yeah. Because regardless of where we came from or how we were raised, we all sort of take on this veteran kind of, or, you know, currently serving kind of ethnicity because we're all you know, we share similar values. We sort of suffer together. Um, and it makes us understand each other and appreciate each other and all the surface stuff about, well, you know, you're a little darker than me or you're a little more pale than me or or whatever it is kind of goes away. And that's pretty awesome. Yeah, and agreed. So anyway, that's that's my my very long story. I love it. I love it. I'm I'm glad. I'm so glad you had the experience. It's fantastic. 
So, and, uh, and I appreciate you. So there you go. Likewise. <laughs> likewise. I yeah, appreciate folks, you. Yeah, you can you can follow Brian online. You can uh, watch this interview and the, the last interview on our site. You can uh, see him on Instagram. You can do all that, but but you can also come join us and meet him in person at UB campus Thursday, May second at five p.m. And you're in for a fantastic presentation and, and uh, discussion with him and some other folks on the panel. And uh, I'll be there as well. So just go to our site. You'll find his bio all of his contact and uh, content. And you also find the details for the event and you don't want to miss out. This is uh, you know, I know we're coming up with the, the eclipse and all that stuff. That's fine. But you know, that's nothing to compare to this event. So <laughs> let's, you know, mark your calendar, come down and see Brian and uh, I'll be there as well. And we'll, we'll be happy to have you. So, and Brian, I'm, I'm excited. So when you get in, we'll, uh, the first dozen wings are on me. We'll make sure we have some awesome. wing time. <laughs> Woo! Love you, Buffalo. Can't wait to come to Buffalo. How many people say that? Beef on Wick, you know. So oh, I can't. Oh, that's what I want to try. And it's and it's May, so the weather's good. We'll only have like three or four feet of snow by that time. So you're good. Definitely gonna bring my shorts. Yeah, it'll it'll be like 30, 35. You'll be fine. Perfect. I'm gonna go barefoot. (laughs) I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go swimming and then maybe go over the falls in that in that in the, the barrel. nail barrel. Yeah, <laughs> we got to empty the barrel first, though, or maybe just half empty it. It'll be a riot. So, all right, folks, in Brian's honor, I'm gonna go ahead and play a fun little song by uh, the Marine Corps band here, and um, stay tuned. But make sure you you check online all the details because we we really want to see you there and show him support. And uh, you're you're in for a really really fun night. So, Brian, thanks again for catching up with us, and I I really i am excited. I can't wait to see you. Can't wait to come. Yep. I love you, Buffalo. And we love you. Yes. (laughs) All right, folks, stand by, hear this uh, wonderful song, and I'll talk to you right after.